been lost on me that the day Nigeria rises, that is the day Africa rises. You may not know, but one out of every five Africans is a Nigerian. And the reason, in my view, why Africa continues to totter in the manner that it does is because Nigeria has never realized our potential. The day Nigeria realizes our potential, that is the day that Africa will rise. So we are here today also to remind Nigeria that it must play her real leadership role, not only in this region, but in Africa, by demonstrating by what and did that Nigeria will be in the forefront in the fight against corruption. Hi everyone, the government of Nigeria is under panic after the uh, youth Gen Z Nigerians starting uh, the 10 days protesting against bad governance. You know why uh, the young Nigerians are protesting? Listen to this, then I will come back. If you are if you're comparing with Nigeria, listen to this. Nigeria has oil before than Dubai. It's a history. They are more rich than us. They have agriculture, they have mining, they have everything, you name it, they have it. Am I right or wrong? When you have a true leadership, which we have, we have nothing, but we have everything because we have the right leadership. That's the only thing you need, a right leader for your country, not corruption. And those who have looked at Africa for a long time, including the famous South African who has advised Rwandese government, Greg Mills, in his book, Why Africa is Poor and What Africa Can Do About It, have asserted that Africans are poor because their leaders have chosen that path. It therefore gladdens me that I have been invited to speak in the presence of elected leaders. It has also been said that one of the reasons why corruption thrives in Africa is because Africa is in the business of canonizing thieves and sanctifying and celebrating the wrong people while it vilifies her good men and women. It has also been argued that Africans are in the business of punishing small thieves and electing the big ones into public office. And that is why, therefore, when one is asked to speak about corruption in Africa, one must ask the question why it is that Africa has never succeeded in this fight. I can't agree more that there is a place for legislation in Africa. But those who have observed Africa have also said that the problem of the fight against corruption in Africa is not the shortage of legislation. In fact, Africa has forests of legislation which are honored in breach which begs the question, what is the problem? The problem in Africa is that we have succeeded rather paradoxically to create an environment which allows thieving and thievery to blossom and thrive. We have created an environment that ensures that our men and women who engage in graft occupy positions of power and influence. And therefore, when one is asked to ask, what is it that other African countries have done in the fight against corruption, which we can emulate, one must remind oneself that there have been a number of countries in Africa which have succeeded in the fight against corruption. And the reason why they have succeeded is because the leadership in those countries have demonstrated by what and did that they mean what they say in the fight against corruption. 
As I said a few minutes before, African countries are quick to sign international instruments that speak against corruption. If you look at the countries which were the first to ratify the UN Convention Against Corruption, African countries were in the forefront. If you look at the countries which were quick to adopt protocols that speak against corruption, African countries were in the forefront, and Nigeria was never far behind. If you look at the countries which adopted legislation against corruption, it is African countries. In other words, African countries have the inclination to sign anything on sight without doing what those things require and demand of them. So, it is not legislation in and of themselves. It is something else. It is the culture that we have evolved over the years in Africa of celebrating ill-gotten wealth. It is not the shortage of political pronouncements in many African countries. Those who occupy political leadership when they seek political office will invariably say that we are going to fight against corruption. But many times, in the fight against corruption, their understanding of it is that they should appear to be fighting corruption without actually fighting corruption. So the question that we must ask ourselves, what must we do, we who have the privilege and honor of serving our countries in the positions to which we have been elected in order to salvage our countries from the chains of graft? There are those Afro-pessimists who hold the view that Africa will perpetually and eternally be mired in the muck and mire of corruption. But the truth is that African countries have demonstrated that it can be done. Countries such as Botswana have demonstrated that when there is a committed leadership at the very top, Corruption can be fought and can be fought successfully. Countries such as Mauritius have demonstrated that corruption can be fought. Countries such as Rwanda have demonstrated that corruption can be fought. And what they have demonstrated is that corruption is so serious a business that it cannot be left to the political class. They have demonstrated that corruption is so serious and ill that it cannot be conducted, the fight against corruption cannot be conducted on the basis of equivocal and vague political pronouncements or technicalities of procedure. They have demonstrated that sometimes there must be a deliberate conspiracy of institutions in order to fight corruption. They have demonstrated that the executive must positively and creatively conspire with the legislature and that the legislature must conspire with the judiciary not to undermine those institutions but to strengthen those institutions. And I hold the view that it can be done and it must be done because if it is not done, many African countries will never realize their potential. It has also been demonstrated by those countries that in order to fight corruption, there must be collaboration of a continental nature. And it is not lost on me that the African Union has brought to pass the African Convention for Combating and Preventing Corruption, which is a continental instrument that allows African countries to participate in the fight against corruption through collaboration. And it can be done through regional efforts in the ECOWAS region. The ECOWAS environment provides an opportunity for Nigeria and the countries in this part of the world, an opportunity to engage in the fight against corruption in a positive manner. And it's not only at the continental level that Nigeria must demonstrate this. Nigeria must also demonstrate her leadership position in the world. The United Nations Convention Against Corruption provides several opportunities which can be exploited by members 
states, including Nigeria, to ensure that funds that have been ill-gotten are repatriated and the men and women who engage in such unconscionable and harmful behavior are punished in accordance with the law that the world may know that if you reap where you have not sown, there are consequences to it. It is also important to create an environment that is hostile for people to participate in corruption. There was a time when I believed that procurement laws in and of themselves were a magic one, which upon being waived would eliminate corruption in the civil service. But over the years, I've come to realize that procurement laws only allows people to steal in accordance with the law. And that therefore, do not be under the impression that laws in and of themselves will solve the problem. As a young boy, I read the great Nigerian writer, Chinua Achebe, who said that since men have learned to shoot without mis without missing, Eneke the bird has learned to fly without patching. So we who are here must remember that when we are enacting laws regarding procurement, sometimes we do so in a manner that provides an opportunity for bureaucrats to still in a manner that lends a veneer of legality to their illegal activities. The quality of laws that we enact are therefore very important. We must also as a country look at the lifestyle of the individuals who engage in public office. How is it that in Africa, when an individual whom we knew to be a pauper is appointed as a public official, on whom we knew to be a pauper is elected, permit me and forgive me at once, members of Senate and members of the House of Representatives, that no sooner have you set foot in the Senate or the House of Representatives. Once upon a time, the late former Prime Minister of Congo, Patis Emil Lumumba, before being assassinated, said the time will come when Africans will write their own history. The history that will not be written in Paris, in Washington, in London, or in Brussels, but the history that will be written in Africa. What we see today, Africans are starting to write their own history. Africans are awakening up. They want accountability. They're asking difficult questions to leaders, how is it possible the richest continent in terms of resources is the poorest continent in health? You remember the young leader of Burkina Faso, Captain Ibrahim Traore, asked the African elders leaders this question that this generation or his generation does not understand. How is it possible the richest resource continent, Africa, is the poorest continent in this world? How is it possible? How is it possible we are rich at the same time we are poor? So as I speak to you now, Nigerians are on the streets demonstrating against bad governance. Despite President Ibora Tunub has warned them, but they decided to enter on the street to demand good governance. They want changes. They want to see how they can be beneficiaries of their natural resources. All of us, we know Nigeria is the main producer of oil, but Nigeria is importing diesel, petrol from Arab countries. How is it possible you have oil, then you import oil? Who own these resources? 
So that is the question that Africans, young people, are, are, are asking to the current leaders. Our leaders who are leading this continent from now to 20 years to come, they are going to face a lot of challenges because this time around, young Africans are decided to take their responsibilities. There's no way you can escape, escape this question. These young people started asking this question in Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. They removed leaders through coups. They went to Kenya recently, where anti government protests demanded accountability of leaders. They didn't stop there. They went to Uganda against anti-corruption protests and now they're in Nigeria. They will not stop there. They are going to Ghana. They will not stop there. They will go in different parts of this continent. The time is now for our leaders to speak with these young people, to tell the young people the truth that we have these resources but we are not the owners of these resources. Oh, we have these resources we have signed, or maybe previous governments have signed poor contracts. So let us wait and see how we can negotiate with those who are being exporting these resources to uh, sign a new contract on how we can benefit from our natural resources. Africa is rich, but look at the lives of the Africans. Africans are living in poor lives. And sometimes you see our young men and women decided to run away from this continent. They are led to lost their lives in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Atlantic Seas, in the Sahel Desert. Why? Because they see nothing in their homeland. They have decided to seek keen pasture in other parts of the world while they are risking their lives. So, my dear kings and queens, let us those who are in power see how you can create jobs you can support this generation you can do what is good in life to make sure that Africans are the beneficiaries of their own resources let us change our education systems and having an education system that will enable our people to see how they can add value to their resources, how they can use their resources to make wealth. Africans need opportunities. Opportunities are there. Africans are not empty-headed. Africans, they have something. They know everything. They can do anything, but they're not given the chance. Don't use militaries, policies, to undermine the voices of these Africans. The time has come to bring Africans on the table. They are under the table for almost 400 years. Now they have decided to come on the table. So, those few words, have a nice time. Thank you.